happening on Friday. And at the same time, we're going to start to see some Arctic air plunge southward down the plains. And so as a result, we're going to start to see uh, heavier snowfall break out across uh, parts of the plains and western Midwest. And then um, even uh, with, with the, the storm being pretty vigorous, we're actually going to even see some thunderstorms down towards Texas and possibly even some severe storms across eastern Texas as we head towards Friday. So uh, a very active storm. And then as that progresses eastward this weekend, that's really when the, uh, the big impacts are going to be seen as the storm strengthens and heads up towards the Ohio Valley and northeast. There's going to be a swath of very heavy snowfall with the storm. Uh, the exact location of that snow is still a little bit uncertain. Um, there's going to be, you know, certainly somewhere from the Ohio Valley to the northeast, we'll see uh, some pretty heavy snowfall totals over a foot in many areas there, especially as you head up towards New England. Um, but exactly how close to the coast the, the, the heavier snowfall gets uh, and the, uh, you know, exact kind of boundary of, the, of that uh, heavier snow is still a little bit questionable being a few days out. But certainly uh, interior areas of the northeast, like Albany and, and up towards Burlington, Vermont, and, and places like that, uh, could be seeing some very heavy snowfall totals this Saturday and Sunday. As that, uh, as that storm moves through. But by Monday, things should be pretty quiet as the storm lifts out. So the end of the, of the holiday weekend should be uh, much better up there, but certainly uh, cold air is going to be coming in behind the storm, though, so most areas are going to be turning quite a bit colder across the central U.S. this weekend and then the eastern U.S. as we head into early next week. So uh, a good shot of Arctic air coming in right on the heels of this storm. And, of course, obviously uh, not just uh, the northeast, but also back across the, uh, the central U.S. We'll be looking at impacts from uh, or, you know, on the, uh, the football games this weekend, too. So uh, there could be a pretty impactful uh, weather situation in Kansas City for the playoff game there uh, as the, uh, the cold air surges in on the, on the back side of the storm. So uh, some wide-ranging impacts for sure across the entire country from now through, through Sunday. Oh, wow. And, of course, it'll be fine by the time we have to commute back to work after the holiday, of course. Yeah, that's um, the way it usually works out. <laughs> exactly. Ruins your weekend and uh, makes for a, a nice week. Uh, exactly. I would like to add, as you get into the mid-Atlantic and perhaps into southern New England, where the warmer air will be able to get with this storm system, there uh, will be some heavy rain and some gusty winds. And then once that system pulls away, the cold air will come in pretty quick behind it. So you might have to w watch out for some flash freeze issues or, you know, or refreeze issues. So anything that falls will probably freeze through sidewalks, roadways. So that even after the fact, there could be some impacts as we get towards later Sunday and into Sunday night. Oh, wow. All right. Um, uh, let's uh, announce a few things, just logistical things, for the webinar this morning. During our presentation today, we encourage everybody to ask questions at any time. You can do this by typing questions into the Q&A box that's located at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Your questions will not be viewable by other attendees and will be addressed by all of our presenters during the Q&A session at the end of the Outlook. Um, also, I am recording today's uh, Midwinter 2009 Outlook, and a rebroadcast link will be available on DTN.com and also emailed to all registrants within 48 hours. Also with that um, rebroadcast link, I'll have the seasonal infographic um, that lets you know what's happening in your region. Um, it looks like we're coming towards the top of the hour, so we will go ahead and get started with the formal long-range uh, weather outlook. So hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for the DTN 2019 Midwinter Weather Outlook. As many of you know, WDT was acquired by DTN in October of 2018, and we and our colleagues at WDT have been working to integrate our businesses and bring you the best platform, service, and forecast in the industry. Today actually marks the first joint seasonal outlook with both long-range forecast teams. In today's midwinter update, our team will cover a recap of this winter to date, anticipated temperature trends, outlook for snowfall in areas of drought improvement, and the impact of severity of winter conditions in your region. My name is Crystal Finnis, and I'll be your moderator for today. And presenting with us are Jeff Johnson, Stephen Strum, and Nathan Hamlin. We also have Eric Faulkner on the line uh, with our long range team. Jeff Johnson is a certified consulting meteorologist focusing on long-range and seasonal weather, as well as climate-related issues. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Meteorology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he became an American Meteorological Society CCM in 1993. He has 40 years of experience in weather forecasting for various industries. 
Stephen Strum is the Vice President of Extended Forecast Services for DTN. He comes um, to us from our Norman team. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Meteorology from Penn State and a Master's of Science in Meteorology from the University of Oklahoma. Between 2003 and 2009, he taught economic meteorology at Oklahoma State University in Tulsa. Steve has been forecasting weather with a focus on energy for over 20 years. Also presenting today is Nathan Hamlin. Nathan is our long-range team lead meteorologist for DTN. He specializes in mid-range, long-range, and seasonal forecasting for energy, agriculture, transportation, and construction. Nate has 15 years of operational weather forecasting experience. So we have a great team here today um, to do the midwinter outlook. Our first presenter is Jeff Johnson. And Jeff, it looks like you have controlled the presentation. So please begin. Well, great. Uh, thank you, Crystal, and uh, welcome, everybody. We've got uh, a lot of information, as usual, to cover here. And we have three presenters. I'll uh, start out uh, by explaining our little subtitle here, the bad, the good, and the ugly. It's, uh, twist on a, a movie from decades ago, but you'll understand exactly what that theme means in terms of, uh, of this uh, winter season. Uh, what we're going to be covering today is just a quick review of uh, last uh, late winter season, uh, bring back memories or nightmares for some of you, uh, a review then of uh, the first half of the winter so far, and then uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Nathan, who will provide our forecast uh, outlook here, looking at our uh, two methods, one looking at uh, analog patterns based on the uh, uh, weak El Nino that we have this year, and then uh, also look at uh, the character of the polar vortex, as well as uh, computer model projections, and try to summarize all that with our uh, midwinter outlook. And then uh, we'll hand it over to uh, Stephen who will uh, tell us more about uh, WDT, some of the capabilities and expertise with, with uh, that group. And at the end, we'll uh, leave some time for questions and answers. But our goal here today is really to uh, help you out to uh, make intelligent and actionable uh, uh, decisions uh, with the weather insights that uh, we're going to uh, be presenting for you. So starting out here, just a very quick review of uh, one year ago how the January through March uh, season uh, ended up. We had a lot of cold air, as seen on the left, from uh, Montana down through the north central United States, a very a cold late winter and early spring. However, it was uh, quite mild in the southwestern U.S. as well as the Gulf Coast and up along the east coast. Precipitation-wise, we had uh, generally drier than normal conditions, as indicated by the uh, yellow and orange shades. Uh, over California and Oregon through uh, the southern Rockies uh, into uh, western Texas, as well as the southeast, uh, well below normal precipitation for that uh, three-month period. But uh, quite a bit of heavy rainfall uh, occurred from east Texas northeastward into the Ohio Valley region, so pretty wet spring in, uh, in that area. And I think most of that actually did fall during the month of, of February. Looking at the uh, monthly temperatures uh, last year, uh, January we had a very warm out in the west, cold in the east, and then in February a fairly uh, major reversal to extremely cold temperatures in the uh, northern plains, northern Rockies region, and almost spring-like conditions uh, erupted in the eastern U.S. And uh, then in March uh, the pattern flipped once again. Uh, uh, more cold air spilled out of the northern plains into the east, where the warmth was confined mainly to the Texas region. And then in April, uh, a very lingering cold pattern uh, east of the Rockies uh, delayed uh, the start of spring and extended the winter season. And then the, uh, the snowfall last year from January 15th until the end of the season, uh, the map on the left shows the total snowfall that occurred. It's easier to look at the uh, departures from normal, though, on the map on the right. Uh, the uh, snowfall anomalies uh, above average across most of the northern part of the United States, where we did have a fairly active storm track, and that continued well uh, through the month of, of April. Now, uh, what has happened so far this winter? Uh, we had uh, actually kind of a early start to uh, the winter season this year. Uh, November turned uh, quite cold, 
and uh, that cold pattern uh, persisted into early December. And then we flipped around and had a, a milder pattern develop in the middle part of December, and that has lasted uh, into the present time. Snowfall, we have had a number of uh, significant snow events occur across the country in various uh, areas. I'll show you those locations in, in a, another few slides. Uh, another story uh, was significant rainfall early part of the winter. Uh, that map on the bottom of that uh, left slide shows the rainfall departures over the last uh, 90 days and the quite heavy precipitation from Texas through the southeast and up uh, through the uh, East Coast areas, and a lot of that uh, did fall in the earlier part of, of winter. It has since uh, lessened somewhat recently. Uh, also take note, uh, drier than normal the last 90 days, Northern California up through the Pacific Northwest. Also, what was the early winter jet stream pattern that uh, caused uh, this uh, uh, setup? Well, the, the pattern uh, from the first part of November through about mid-December, the map on the right shows the the main upper air pattern. Uh, we had a jet stream flowing out of uh, north central Canada, diving down into Mexico, and then turning uh, eastward across the Gulf of Mexico. And the uh, portions of the polar vortex uh, were located over the eastern part of the U.S., and that's what brought us that cold uh, start to the winter season. Uh, that high pressure indicated over the uh, British Columbia region uh, is more indicative of a warmer pattern and a drier pattern. Um, so that was the early winter setup. What happened as we moved more into mid-December is that uh, piece of the polar vortex uh, moved out and that the large area of high pressure uh, became dominant across much of North America and we, we transitioned into a, into a, a warmer pattern. So uh, we had essentially uh, two parts to the to the winter uh, season so far. We had uh, temperatures in November uh, well below average east of the Rockies. Uh, December we saw a reversal to uh, well above normal temperatures across much of the U.S. And then so far in January uh, for the first half of the month that warm pattern continues. If we break this down um, into different areas or, or time periods, uh, with the cold part, which we're calling the bad, it was November 1 through about December 16th, and uh, you can see how it was cold during that uh, six-week period for the eastern half of the country. And then the good part, um, feeding into our theme of the subtitle, is the uh, warmer uh, pattern that developed uh, mid-December and persists through now. And then the ugly part, uh, well, you're going to have to stay tuned for that, uh, Nate. Nathan will uh, cover that in the in the forecast and see exactly what we we mean by by that. In terms of energy usage, a review of what we've had so far on the left, uh, the heating degree days, uh, which helps to measure how much uh, fuel is needed for heating. Uh, we generally, we've had uh, a warmer season so far across most of the country, just a little bit more heating demand in the Texas region as well as into uh, the southern Rockies. Uh, compared to last year, the map on the right shows it's uh, much colder in the southwestern U.S. and uh, then uh, a little warmer than than last year from the Mississippi Valley region all the way to the uh, east coast, with the exception of Maine into uh, southeastern Canada. Uh, snowfall so far this year, up to the present time, the map on the left shows how much snow has fallen, and we do see some areas that uh, have had uh, significant snowfall, especially the uh, New England area in the New York State, as well as the uh, northern Great Lakes region and the uh, Rocky Mountains and Sierras. map on the right uh, shows departures from normal. The green would indicate above normal uh, snowfall, so uh, the southern Rockies, as well as into uh, the central and southern Sierras, above normal. Above normal snowfall in the central plains, eastward through uh, about the St. Louis area, through Illinois. And then the mid-Atlantic region, above normal, as well as northern New England, but uh, well below normal snowfall, snowfall so far in the uh, Great Lakes region, as well as the northwestern part of the country. And there have been a few notable storm events uh, this year. They started out early. 
on November 14 to 16. You can see that swath of heavy snow in the northeastern part of the country. We had up to 15 inches of snow that fell in parts of New York and Pennsylvania. Also, some freezing rain occurred with that storm system in the Ohio Valley area into uh, the mid-Atlantic region. And strong winds, 50 to 60 miles per hour, occurred with that storm uh, in New York, New Jersey, into uh, Delaware. Then uh, November 24 through 26, around the Thanksgiving time frame, we had a swath of uh, heavy snow that moved uh, through northern Illinois, dropping up to uh, 13 inches of snow. Then early December, December 1 through 4, about 8 to 14 inches of snow, parts of Nebraska, Minnesota, and Montana. And uh, there was also some very heavy rain with that uh, storm system in Georgia and Florida. It doesn't show up on that map, but 4 to 12 inches of rain occurred with, with uh, that same storm system. And then uh, as we move more into the middle part of December, 8 through 10, we had a significant snow event in the Carolinas, up to 34 inches in the mountains of North Carolina. Also, uh, that same storm brought 10 inches uh, to a localized area in the Texas Panhandle. And then the more recent event, uh, just a few days ago, January 11 to 13, we had uh, 5 to 10 inches of snow in Washington, D.C., 16 inches in Illinois, 20 inches in uh, Missouri, and there was also freezing rain in North Carolina and Virginia. So fairly uh, changeable and active uh, season so far this, this winter. Uh, currently on the ground, we do have snow, as shown on the map on the left, uh, in areas uh, along the Canadian border states as well as the Rockies, and then also uh, a swath from uh, Kansas eastward through the Ohio Valley into the mid-Atlantic area. The map on the right shows differences from what's normal on this date. Anything in yellow means there's less snow on the ground than what is typical, and you can see abnormally lower snow right now, Montana, Wyoming, through uh, the north central U.S. and especially uh, Wisconsin and uh, Michigan, as well as parts of uh, southern New York, southern New England, and above normal in the blue in that uh, swath uh, through the central plains and lower Ohio Valley due to a couple of good snowstorms that moved through that area. Just a quick point on the current drought conditions. We still have a, a drought uh, in portions of the west. The most extreme it would be located in the Four Corners region. Uh, the forecast over the next 90 days uh, does suggest there will be some improvement uh, due to uh, expected above normal precipitation in the southwestern U.S., but uh, into the uh, northwestern areas, uh, we could uh, actually see uh, drier conditions develop and not bring any, any help to that. And then finally, before turning it over to uh, Nathan, just wanted to uh, show a review of the last uh, uh, 12 years of, uh, of winter seasons, uh, showing that we do see a lot of uh, differences from year to year, uh, no clear trend that uh, all winters are, are getting warmer or colder. We do see uh, variability, and uh, it's all caused by uh, large-scale uh, circulation patterns that we try to figure out in our in our uh, winter forecast uh, outlook. Um, but uh, at this point, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Nathan, who's our uh, team lead on long-range forecasting, and uh, he'll give you a lot, of, a lot of details on what we expect for the balance of the, of the winter season. So uh, take it away, Nathan. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. That was fantastic information. It kind of primed us up for – you know, from where we've been, and now we'll know, you know, apply that to where we're going here. Um, going forward, let's take a look at what goes into a seasonal outlook before we get into it. Um, one of the first things we look at are, is the ENSO state, which is a measure of ocean temperatures near the equatorial region of the Pacific Ocean. The, temperature of, the temperatures on the sea surface will determine the main location of the west to east jet stream. And usually these patterns persist for months on average. Um, we use analogs from past events to kind of provide clues for what might occur overall in the upcoming season. And uh, El Nino is in place this winter. And usually when you have an El Nino, the storm track heads towards the southern part of the U.S. And we've certainly seen that in, for the most part so far. Sub-seasonal outlooks here, so you get smaller time scales, more like one week, maybe two weeks of time frame, maybe a little bit more, where the main east to west jet stream changes. Um, 
for example, if you get buckling in the jet stream, you have more north to south flow rather than east to west, and this can produce highly anomalous temperature and precipitation patterns. Some blocking patterns that, that tend to stagnate anomalies in one region. And uh, we use forecast models here to estimate the future state of the atmosphere based on ocean temperatures, air current air situation, and sea sea ice in the northern sections. Um, Forecast can extend out several months or even seasons here, but individual storm events are best predicted by the global models and the ensembles, which predict conditions for a few weeks to or a few days to maybe as much as a couple weeks ahead. So, looking any further out than that, it's the science is not quite there to predict individual storm events. So what are the main drivers for the rest of the winter here? We have a weak El Nino, and the warmest temperatures are in the central Pacific Ocean. So that's what we mean by central Pacific centered. Um, a warm phase of the PDO, which means basically warmer than normal temperatures in the northeastern Pacific Ocean. The warm Atlantic phase does persist, but you can see some cooler air trying to mix in, basically from the northeast coast up through just south of Greenland, so a modest warm phase. And the uh, polar vortex character is also going to be a driver going forward. So in the ENSO forecast here from modeling centers all across the world, the model average is in the red and green thick lines here. And the idea here is that the water temperatures will stay above the El Nino threshold of 0 0.5 degrees Celsius above normal. So take away from January through March and then into even into the well into the spring we'll still see that. But the idea here is that the strength of the El Nino will gradually decline, but it should stay should still stay at El Nino as we go forward. And uh the aforementioned central Pacific El Nino versus the eastern Pacific El Nino, you can see the difference on the left here where the warmer temperatures are. So the eastern Pacific ones, you see all the warm air bottled up closer to South America, whereas in the central Pacific, you'll see it southwest, southeast of Hawaii and west of South America. And that does make a tremendous difference on what kind of pattern you'll see. So for the eastern Pacific precipitation, typically it's wetter in the plains and the corn belt and up in most of the Midwest, and certainly across from California across the south. But if you look at the central Pacific one in the bottom center, you see a drier pattern from the upper Midwest down through the Ohio Tennessee valleys and up into the Great Lakes. A wetter look is kind of suppressed further south across California, southern Texas, and along the Gulf Coast. Temperature wise, on the right there, is definitely a tremendous impact. The eastern Pacific ones are typically much warmer for most of the country, especially the northern tier from the northern Rockies and Plains all the way through the Great Lakes in the northeast. You see above normal temperatures prevalent, and even in the even from Texas eastward, anomalies are not significant. It's still modestly mild. Most of the cooler air is in the southwest. When you have a central Pacific El Nino impact, the warmth is more in the northwestern U.S. and maybe into the northern plains for the most part, and that is variable on its own. And then most of the colder air is bottled up further south across Texas through the mid-Atlantic and most of the southeast. So putting all this together, we go through, we, we found years in the past that are lining up semi-similar to what we are expecting this year. And we chose 1958, 69, 78, 91, and 95 as our primary analogs here. And looking at water temperatures, that, that um, those years followed the flow of the El Nino forecast presented earlier, a, keeping the idea of the, El, El, the weaker El Nino going all the way through the winter and well into the spring, and you see a gradual decline in, in the average of these as we get towards late spring and into the summer. So what does that mean? Well, from January through March, the main jet stream winds aloft, and you can see here in the oranges and yellows, that's the west to east storm, or west to east jet stream is, is stronger than expected, and you go further north, it's weaker than expected. So Storm track typically follows where the jet stream goes, and those higher than normal speeds to the south strongly suggest that our main storm track would be across the southern U.S. So for individual months, we're looking at temperature and precipitation patterns. Here's January, and our analogs did show 
cooler than normal temperatures indicated in the greens and blues across most of the plains down to the southeast with warmer and normal temperatures from the Great Lakes in New England. Now you saw earlier that we had a very, very warm January so far, so when you see analogs look like this, it tends to clue you in as to something as to what is coming up here, which is uh, why we're why the ugly was mentioned. Um, Precipitation-wise, very wet in California and into the southwest. Also wet from Texas all the way up through the northeast, down through the lower Ohio Valley, and most of the south here. So that is definitely coming to fruition, as you saw from Jeff's presentation earlier. As we move to February, you see a much colder pattern in place everywhere east of the Rockies with an emphasis from the Ohio Valley into the southeast. You see warmth all over the west, especially the northwest. And precipitation patterns here, you see much drier look for most of the country here, with the exception of the extreme southern part of Texas all the way through maybe Florida, and in particular focus on the southwest and California. More neutral signal for the Rockies up to the northern plains. From March here, we show that a continuation of cooler conditions. The west comes out of the warmth and goes back to modestly cooler conditions. Some of the colder conditions will probably be across the central and southern plains, according to the analogs, with more of a neutralish signal from the Great Lakes through northern New England. And we continue with the same idea as February, keeping the wet conditions in the southwest in California and along the immediate Gulf Coast, a dry signal overall from the Ohio and Tennessee Valleys to the Great Lakes and into the Northeast. Going forward to April, we see that the pattern reverses. We keep all of the cooler air into the west. We have warmth into the most of the areas east of the Rockies, with the exception of maybe northern New England. And precipitation-wise, we see a little bit weather pattern emerges for a lot of places here, but a particular focus on the lower Mississippi Valley. So putting all this together through the rest of the winter, we do see from January to March, even counting the warmth, we have a cooler signal for most areas east of the Rockies and a little bit more neutral from the northern Great Lakes through northern New England. Warmer temperatures in the northwestern U.S., a little bit, a little bit more neutral in the southwest. Precipitation-wise, wet in California in the southwest all in, will include Texas and the Gulf Coast in that, with drier signal from the Great Lakes in the Midwest all the way up into portions of the northeast. Snowfall analogs for the rest of winter. So each individual year we'll, we'll put up here, and a couple of themes do tend to stand out here, is that we do have snow that is greater than normal, extending further into the south. And each year uh, shows uh, that in general. Uh, another thing you start to see in the Midwest, you see areas of haves and have-nots. So 58, you see the upper Midwest have less snow, and then the plains have more central plains in the middle Mississippi Valley, and then into New England. 69, you see the halves across most of the plains up in the Midwest with less than in the Ohio Valley. 78 was just a bad year overall. Everybody had a lot of snow. 1991 was less snow, but there was a stripe of places that get above normal, and 95 kind of shows the same thing. So there will be some haves and have-nots in these patterns here. It all depends on individual storm tracks as we go forward. Uh, for the rest of the winter here, analogs show the heavier snow, of course, across northern New England through the Great Lakes, but you can see snow fall amounts, as indicated on the left here. Still snow coming for most, yeah, a lot of the country here. Four Corners, uh, northern Rockies will be, be able to get on it, the Sierra as well. Um, but if you look on the right, it's a lot easier to see how it's going to turn out with the, with the uh, anomalies here, and the blue indicates above normal, and from basically across most of the most of uh, Texas, uh, Oklahoma, into the Ohio and Tennessee valleys, and then even up the, in, into the immediate eastern seaboard, we'll see above normal snowfall, at least modestly so, and the analog suggests below normal snow from the northern plains to the Great Lakes. Now, it's important to note about the Great Lakes is that probably not going to see much in the way of regular storms that get in there. That should be displaced to the south, but there will be some localized areas that still have a lot of snowfall to come as lake effect gets involved. That, that is well captured on large-scale anomalies because of the localized nature of lake effect. So let's take a look at some sub-seasonal factors here. Typically, when we talk about the polar vortex, it is tucked up right near the North Pole, and there's a pretty strong 
less than each jet stream that flows around it. So this keeps the cold air bottled up closer to the pole and keeps it away from the middle latitudes, including the United States. However, <clears throat> every now and then, this, that jet stream will tend to buckle. And when it does, you see some ridges that develop and troughs that develop downstream from that, so on and so forth. And the polar vortex doesn't like it when its neat and tidy jet stream gets disturbed. So every now and then it can break up into smaller pieces. And those smaller pieces can sink down into those troughs. And when that happens, it can get blocked up there for a while. And some extreme patterns can occur. You should see some anomalies that could be either be very warm or very cold, depending on the location of the of the ridges and troughs. Extreme cold can occur where these little pieces of the polar vortex go, and a lot of times you can't figure out where that's going to go until you get to within a couple of weeks of it, and certainly some of the magnitude of the cold is difficult to predict until we get there. So the sub-seasonal items are a lot more difficult to see from a seasonal perspective. You can certainly know that there's a risk for them, but until we get closer, it's difficult to come up with a lot of the details. And uh, using analogs, maybe we can figure out the best timing and location for these, for the polar vortex disturbances. And if you look at January, the main polar vortex is off the west coast. And the result of that was so far to bring uh, the warmer, you know, the ridge upstream, so it brings warmer air to a lot of the central and eastern United States. But later January, the little PV in the south there, you start to see that tend to occur. But if you look through February and March, a couple things kind of stand out here. You see some of the reds, yellows, and greens. That's higher than normal heights, and that's all that right up near the North Pole here. So as a result, you see some blues and purples there that are further south across the mid-latitudes, and little pieces of the polar vortex can be located in, some, in the deepest part of those. And February, across the eastern United States, pretty clear to see there. And then March, that kind of goes off the eastern U.S. There's the one. In off the west coast as well, but those cooler than normal heights are kind of stuck across the United States. So that means that the northward advance of the jet stream will be kind of slowed up through March here a little bit as we wait for all this blocking to kind of ease out. So that's what the analogs are suggesting here so far. So uh, that's, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is to see how these computer models, see what the computer models are doing and how, how they compare to the analog forecast here. So let's take a look at the next few weeks. First and foremost, let's take a look at the next uh, 10 day here for our model blend. And uh, you can see a lot of snowfall here for a lot of the Midwest up into the great portions of the Great Lakes and into the Northeast. That first stripe from Ohio up into New England is our first system, but then, a, then another system will occur during the later part of the 10 day period. And uh, that that's one mo you know, the model blend does show it there. There's a lot of potential for change when it comes to that, but the idea of another middle Mississippi Valley up in a Great Lakes system will be okay, but you can notice there's some have-nots too, like the upper Midwest, and not a whole lot going on there, and the uh, mid-Atlantic southward, not a lot going on. So again, these things are storm system dependent on where the snow ends up, and haves and have-nots can be pretty close together. Let's take a look at the CFS for the next several weeks here, and this kind of gives us an idea of where the models think we're going here. And for week two, we'll see a flip from warmer to colder here, uh, ending January 26th, indicated with all those blues and purples. And then week three will be probably the worst of it going into week four. So let's say January 27th through the first week of February, you can see all that very, very cold look here, below, well below normal, centered in the north central of the United States. The east coast will be colder, but it won't quite feel the effects of it. Not until we get probably into the February 3rd to February 9th frame here, which is week four, that'll be more centered across the eastern part of the United States. So you get towards the east coast, it'll probably be coldest relative to normal then. You note that the warmth is starting to build across the west during this time. Week five, the model says it'll, the western half of the country will be warm, a little bit cooler in the east, and northern New England will be warm. And we go to week six, then the cold kind of regenerates itself a little bit and reestablishes itself east of the Rockies. Precipitation-wise, above normal precip week two and week three across portions of northern Rockies and northern plains, but also you see a stripe of above normal precipitation from the Gulf Coast all the way up the mid-Atlantic and into New England. 
Then week four, we start to change things up towards that drier solution here. We take all of the precipitation and we move it out west and uh, just a modest amount of above normal precipitation right along mid-Atlantic into southern New England. Week five here, kind of a mixed signal on the model guidance, but the best signals overall are across portions of northern California in northern New England and, again, localized in the Tennessee Valley. A lot of dryness around it. And then week six, we reestablish the wetness along the east coast with drier signal in the Ohio Valley up towards the Great Lakes and the northwestern United States remains dry. Um, extending this out through the months here, the CFS does show that cooler than normal pattern in February in the east with warmth in the northwestern United States. In March, it does not follow the idea of cold. It wants to go very, very warm in the northern tier of the United States, keeps modestly cool conditions closer to the Gulf Coast. April in the bottom, you can see all that red in the north. So same idea as March in May kind of continues that, except for you start to see the southeastern U.S. warm up a little bit. And then June and July, you start to see the anomalies decrease, but the same idea is near to slightly above normal. The, central, the four corners to Texas doesn't really, don't really show much above normal temperatures during that time. Precipitation-wise, the reds and oranges you can see all over the place here show the idea of dryness from the, most of the West Coast, and uh, with the exception of the immediate Gulf Coast, you can see that all the way through the east. Through March here, dryness from northeast Texas up to the Great Lakes with wetness for California and Florida, basically. Uh, April, start to see rain come up into the four corners southern Rockies region and portions of southern Texas, and then right along the east coast. Other than that, more dryness. And then May, June, and July, you start to see rain extend up into the plains pretty efficiently with the dryness basically from the upper Midwest into the Great Lakes. That does persist in the model guidance. Here is the North American Multi-Model Ensemble, NMME, and this thing tends to run a little bit warm, but you can certainly uh, pick out some trends in there, and that does show some value, such as February. You can see all kinds of warmth there with coolness in the southeastern United States. And then March, you can see that it does show the same theme as the CFS with the south-central U.S. being the coolest with warmth across the northern tier. Um, May does show a hole in that warmth through central and southern plains. And then June, July, and August, we tend to see the things warm up a little bit. Um, Precipitation-wise, which we do a little better with this model here, and the ideas are now not much different. You see dryness from the Great Lakes all the way down through Texas. And uh, going through the March here, March is where it gets a little bit different. It does bring some wetness from the Great Lakes uh, through most of the eastern U.S., keeps dryness on the west coast. And then April and May, you start to see an expansion of rain up across southern Rockies and well up into the plains here. So the idea of a wetter spring on these models here is starting to come into fruition. That does continue in June. But the one thing that does happen here as we get into the late part of the spring is dryness develops across the Great Lakes into the northeast. And then a little sneak preview of the summer here. We do have wetter conditions for good chunk of the plains and into the northeast in June, or excuse me, July, and in August, we tend to see the dryness return to the northeast there. But keeping with the wet idea across the plains and then getting into the southeast off and on. The UK MET model, the seasonal forecast here does from February, March, and April, a three-month composite. The greens you can see here in the United States, eastern part is cool, northwestern part is warm. So that idea is consistent with the rest of the models. And the precipitation-wise, February, March, and April, you can start to see the plains become wetter where all the greens are, and you see the dry signal. It's difficult to see, but from the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley, it is there with wetter along the across Texas through Florida. So another theme that continues to pop up. So you can take the analogs and you take all the model guidance, and you wrap it up into a neat and tidy forecast the best you can, and this is what we came up with here. Let's look at some uh, some of the general themes here, kind of a reminder. Central Pacific-based El Nino will continue through the spring, so the primary storm track will be across the south. Be periods of intense Arctic cold when that polar vortex is displaced southward, and there's you know, that's a model guidance in the analogs that certainly show that. 
Colder than normal temperatures are most likely from the north central to the southeastern United States going forward. Milder conditions overall are more likely in the western United States. Uh, winter is going to linger a bit into March here, east of the Rockies. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer than expected to get that to get that uh, jet stream to go northward, but it won't be anything like last year. I believe it'll be March will be more of the transition month as opposed to April. Snowfall will be heavier than average in the southwest with a little bit closer to normal in the north central United States. Lighter precipitation than normal will occur across the Ohio and Tennessee valleys. Although with all the cold air around, there's, that you could still mean localized. Some areas will be able to see normal or even above normal snow. Lake effect snows will be a bit more active as we get that colder air pouring over those warmer lakes. And uh, coastal storm risk along the eastern seaboard will increase as we go forward. So here's our little graphic showing all of that. Northwest, you can see milder, seasonable rain and snow. Uh, the, the southwest here, rain, mountain, snow will be adequate, plentiful, uh, warmer than normal pattern. North, no, northern plains, upper Midwest, more Arctic air, maybe seasonal snowfall. The rain, rainy pattern across the south, closer to the Gulf Coast will be in place, more frequent cold shots. And then... Colder pattern will occur from across the western, or excuse me, the rest of the eastern United States. Coastal storm threats along the eastern seaboard, kind of reduced precipitation in Ohio and Tennessee valleys here, even though snow will still remain possible. So our temperature outlook here, the analogs and computer models do differ here. Our analogs are a bit colder, so the, based on recent trends and the model guidance, our analog forecast will be, so our forecast will be the analogs, but it'll be a little bit warmer than that. So warmer than average in the west, Arctic air will spread south and more frequently during the rest of the winter, especially from the north central to the southeastern United States. A few limited milder periods will occur, give us a little respite from the cold, but it will reinforce itself. And uh, so Jan January, you notice that Jeff showed you all that warmth that was occurring across um, most of the country here, and even with that, the second half of the month should be able to at least balance that out. You can see some cooler than normal temperatures from the Great Lakes through maybe central and southern plains. So we're balancing part of that out, so that warmth will be hacked away quite a bit. For February, cooler than normal temperatures for most of the central and eastern United States, with the exception of maybe, the, maybe northern New England where modest warmth will be in place. Warmth will be in the west, and we get to March. Modest warmth in the north in the modest warmth in the north with coolness across most of the central and southern U.S. Put it out all together, January 16th to March 31st, cooler than normal from basically everywhere east of the Rockies with the exception of northern New England. Warmth will be likely across the west with the emphasis on the northwest United States and maybe some modest warmth across northern New England. Precipitation outlook. The main storm track, again, will be fairly set up across the south, heavier than average winter precipitation, probably in the southwest, especially California into the Rockies. Slightly heavier precipitation will extend across the Gulf Coast up the eastern seaboard. And you can see lighter precipitation totals from the northern plains into the Great Lakes overall, with the exception of the lake effect areas. Below normal precipitation will be most likely for the Tennessee and Ohio Valley regions. And mixed precipitation types will be a threat as you go further south due to the more colder air getting involved. So you can easily have a situation where you have below normal precipitation, but yet near or even slight, slightly above normal snowfall totals and so as you go south. Putting it all together, in January, it's a wetter situation from the Midwest up into the Mid-Atlantic Northeast. The drier conditions probably stay tucked in closer to the Great Lakes. Northwestern U.S. is bone dry. We go into February, a lot drier signal. A little bit wetter, maybe, maybe near Florida, but the wettest overall should be in the southwest with an emphasis on California. And then March, we start to see the wetness expand northward a little bit from California through the most of the southwest and then through most of the southeast. Put it all together, drier northern tier, wetter southern tier. That's pretty much the way it's going to go. Um, and there's some exceptions to this could be maybe right along the immediate eastern seaboard if we get a storm or two to get up in there. But that's pretty much the idea here going forward with our precipitation outlook. So with this, I will turn it over to Stephen Strum. We can tell us all about weather decision technologies. 
Take it away, Steve. All right. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, great job on the discussion of uh, what we've seen so far and what we're looking at for the balance of the, the winter season. And uh, I'm just going to go through a little bit, uh, kind of give a little overview, overview here of WDT and the, the Frontier team uh, as we join into the main DTN family. And you've already seen some of the graphics and products that we produce uh, in the presentation thus far. But we'll just do a little quick overview here. Again, WDT is a, a Norman-based, uh, Norman, Oklahoma-based company, uh, been in business for 15 years with 62 degree meteorologists and uh, even more employees in that, obviously, when you factor in the rest of the team. Um, but quite a few PhDs and masters and, and bachelors of science uh, uh, meteorologists on staff. So uh, a large uh, uh, group of meteorologists working uh, right next to the, to the University of Oklahoma. So a lot of resources shared there as well. So a lot of uh, great science activity happening down there uh, in the uh, Norman area. Uh, but D uh, DT WDT has a, a great archive of historical weather going back to 1900, all kinds of patents, uh, uh, various pro uh, APIs and products, including historical forecast and observed data. Uh, we have a lot of great GIS services. Uh, perhaps most notably, we're known for, uh, for Radar Scope, which is a, a great application for uh, either your phone, computer, or even your Apple TV. And uh, again, DTN acquired um, uh, WDT in October of this past year, and then uh, Frontier was actually acquired prior to that by WDT in 2016. So now all of us are joined together into the larger DTN family so we can uh, help to combine our resources and produce a lot of uh, uh, enhancements to all of our products uh, going forward. Now on the Frontier side of things, what we've always done is focused mostly on the energy trading side of things, so looking at natural gas and, and the various energy products that, uh, that are traded actively. And so we produce a lot of our, our products uh, uh, geared for the, that type of the market. So we do daily summaries for the next uh, couple of weeks, 15-day uh, daily forecast, hourly forecast, um, a lot of degree day uh, specific forecasts, so heating oil, uh, natural gas weighted degree days, uh, that kind of uh, product as well. And, and we do a lot of longer term forecasts, including a weekly 16 to 30 day forecast and a seasonal forecast going out for the next uh, 9 to 12 months as updated twice per month. And obviously you've seen that, uh, uh, a lot of that data here in the presentation so far today. Now, uh, we also have a lot of other great products available uh, on the website, um, uh, including uh, model graphics uh, from all the various major models. Uh, again, all those seasonal forecast graphics there on the top left, and as well as, again, the, the, the products that show uh, forecasts for uh, degree days going forward, comparisons to past years, even wind energy products. So a lot of uh, data there is available on the frontier side of things. Again, this will all be integrated into the DTN um, suite of services going forward here during the course of 2019. Now, we also, uh, do have uh, seasonal forecasts not just for the U.S., but also globally. So here's an, an example here of some of the forecasts for February through April, uh, looking at the whole global pattern. So you can see, uh, again, that what uh, Nathan was talking about with the colder air across uh, the eastern U.S. here for the balance of the winter season. But also we're looking at the uh, cold across parts of eastern Europe into Asia as well. And you can see the areas that are looking to be uh, pretty warm as we head into the upcoming spring season across a lot of uh, southern uh, Asia and even down towards Australia as they wrap up their their uh, summer season down there. So um, again, we do have uh, products that are global in nature on the seasonal side of things, not just focused on the U.S. itself. Now on the weather ops side, which is uh, the main forecasting side uh, within WDT, which is joining the DTN family, uh, all kinds of great products there as well, including, including a lot of alerting capabilities, um, a lot of uh, great data process there. We do uh, uh, winter uh, uh, planner products at this time of the year, looking at daily and uh, you know and uh, weekly type of snowfall uh, forecasts, ice accumulation forecasts, and that kind of thing. A lot of detailed tropical forecasts as we head into the tropical season. You'll be seeing more of those as we head into the upcoming hurricane season for the Atlantic Basin, and a lot of great site-specific forecasts that are great for event planning and, and that type of thing as well. So certainly uh, a lot of great new products uh, that'll be uh, joining into the. the into the overall DTN suite of products as we go forward. And you can be looking for more of those to come your way as you head through uh, 2019. And certainly um, you can uh, get back uh, to people here uh, uh, you know, from this webinar to find out more information on some of these new products which are available uh, within the DTN family. 
So to kind of wrap things up here, again, uh, Nathan was talking about the, uh, the forecast for the balance of the winter season. Again, the ENSO patterns with the Central Pacific-based uh, El Nino favor the overall colder trends going forward for the balance of the winter season. Most of the climate models are also in that camp as well, favoring colder weather developing here uh, this coming weekend and really persisting on and off right on through the balance of February into the uh, at least the first half of March. Um, and then, uh, again, a lot of the uh, other climate indicators, such as what we've seen with happened with the polar vortex recently, uh, also favor that colder central and eastern U.S. pattern. So everything is pretty much coming into alignment for a colder uh, last half of the winter season across the eastern half of the country. The exact details of uh, which city gets what amount of snow and that kind of thing remain to be seen. But again, uh, as we've seen, uh, the overall pattern looks to be cold with a suppressed jet stream uh, favoring a, uh, a snowier potential across the southern U.S. And again, even though the forecast is to be drier than normal across a lot of the uh, the country heading into February, again, with the cold air in place, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean below normal snowfall for especially the southern U.S., where snowfall normals are actually fairly low. And so a lot of those areas across the southern half of the country that maybe don't see a lot of snow in some years, but will have the potential with all the cold air in place to possibly see uh, a snowstorm or two as we head through the balance of the winter season. Again, some risk for some of those storms to turn up the east coast, and, uh, and that will have to be watched closely as well as we head through February, since that tends to be a climatologically favored time of the year to see east coast snowstorms storms, especially uh, in New York City and Boston. A lot of the storm uh, uh, frequency is, is uh, kind of peaking during the month of February uh, for those areas climatologically. So we're kind of hitting into that time of year now where we do see more of those storms uh, produce snowfall uh, along the East Coast. And so with an active southern stream of the jet stream, we'll have to watch that uh, going forward as well. But uh, again, the western U.S., which has been pretty cold here the last month or so, while the eastern U.S. has been warm, will be flipping around and also trending warmer um, as we head through the balance of the winter season. Although, again, we may still, say, we may, we may still stay fairly wet and snowy across the, uh, the, the southwestern U.S., and so possibly the Sierra could be picking up some needed snowfalls we head into uh, the upcoming uh, summer season. After the drier year last year in the fires, uh, possibly some relief uh, in that regard uh, going forward into this uh, upcoming summer season. Uh, for California and the Southwest. So with that, uh, we can open things up to questions and uh, take any that you might have. Now pass things back to uh, Crystal to, uh, to handle those. All right, thank you everyone. That's a great presentation and an overview of where we're, where we're at today. It looks like we have a few questions, so we'll get started and answer as many as we can. Please note that due to the large number of online attendees, we can't address specific county or city forecasts during this session. So um, we can, I will compile those and get those to the team and, and we maybe can do some follow-ups in email. Um, so the first question is um, for Stephen. Uh, we had an early start to winter in October. It looks like we're moving back towards a normal winter from an HDD viewpoint. How might the whole season end up? So um, with the current forecast for the, the balance of the winter season, uh, we currently have the overall HDD forecast for the winter to be pretty close to normal. Um, the potential is there, though, for the cold to become pretty extreme for a couple of weeks uh, going forward into late January and into the first half of February. And so if the pattern kind of materializes and sort of um, reaches its sort of uh, potential um, and that cold does become pretty extreme for a while, then we could actually see the HDD totals swing back to um, above average for the for the winter season as a whole. Obviously, we had this warm stretch here for the last month or so, so it's going to take a while to get back up to uh, above normal HDD levels. Um, and it also kind of depends where you sort of draw the boundary. If you if you extend things into March, and if we do see the cold continue through March, then we may see the entire you know sort of heating season end up above average, um, you know, with those extra couple weeks of cold added in during the during the March time frame. All right. Um, this one came in online. It was on our two-week forecasts. We're seeing predictions of 7 to 10 inches of snow up to a week in advance, which typically are greatly reduced down to an inch or less by 24 hours before. Is there an algorithm that always defaults to the worst-case scenario? Well, uh, I can handle I can, that. If, okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Um, uh, Certainly, uh, obviously, depends on your on your local forecast office, and there may be very variations there. Um, but uh, you know, the, the biggest problem with snowstorms, obviously, is the exact track, and, and so many of the times, uh, the forecast for the actual snowfall 
uh, verifies pretty closely, but if a storm shifts 50 miles north or south uh, at any given point, um, then you know, your, your situation can go from being potentially looking at a foot of snow to getting nothing or getting rain. And, and, and so that's like a constant battle with, uh, with, with winter storms, especially when we've seen these storms recently, the last several weeks where they've occurred with fairly marginal temperatures, temperatures pretty close to freezing. We've seen a lot of cases with, with, the, with these storms where uh, small shifts have resulted in some areas uh, going from uh, a forecast of a lot of snow to hardly anything just because of a couple degree change in temperature or a slight shift in the storm track. So, uh, you know, the, the models uh, in general tend to do fairly well on the overall storm system, but the placement and the exact track, you know, a week out uh, is still something that uh, can be challenging. And again, uh, you know, a 50, a 50 mile error in the track can dramatically change the outcome for, for a given point. So the forecasts for a region are, are far more accurate than uh, a given point uh, uh, as you extend out that far. But certainly the last uh, several weeks have seen some uh, you know some interesting uh, you know model differences in the in the in the storms, and so things haven't always gone quite as planned uh, for some of these recent storms because of the marginal temperatures and, and tracks and so forth. All right, um, this one looks like it's for Jeff. Um, Jeff, can you tell me uh, how long the will the split polar vortex last? Yeah, typically we see them last uh, on the order of a month. Some of the stronger ones uh, up to six weeks, or maybe even two months. Um, the uh, current uh, polar vortex split that uh, actually began way up in the stratosphere a few weeks ago, uh, this one is uh, pretty extreme in terms of uh, the warming that occurred up in that area. So uh, I think the most likely this is going to be a long duration event, uh, which does fit into our uh, forecast of keeping the cold risks going uh, at least into the middle part of March. Um, so I, I think uh, um, more on the order of uh, six weeks to uh, possibly eight weeks before this uh, split vortex uh, situation resolves itself and we come back to a more normal situation for the uh, latter part of March. All right. Uh, with that question, somebody also submitted, do you expect the severe weather season uh, preliminarily to be delayed due to the cold possibly extending well into March? Yeah, yeah I think, I, I, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I think a couple differences on that in terms of uh, the March severe weather season, that, that cold air will probably delay things for a large part of the com country with the exception of maybe the Gulf Coast region. Um, there will be enough warmth uh, along the Gulf Coast with a fairly active storm track that uh, could see some potent severe weather uh, from Texas uh, along the Gulf Coast. As we move more into April and the pattern starts to moderate something back toward uh, normal or maybe even above normal, then, uh, then those cold effects uh, won't hamper the severe weather season as much. So uh, first guess on that is probably a more uh, typical uh, type of uh, severe weather season evolving then uh, for April and into, uh, into May. All right. Uh, Nathan, this one might be for you. Can you expand on what is meant by a more active lake effect in the Great Lakes region? Certainly. We're, when we see the pattern change, we're going to see colder air masses come further south and go run across the Great Lakes. So what, the Great Lakes are a bit warm right now because of the lack of cold air that we've seen so far. So once that happens, there will be a tremendous difference between the air mass temperature and the temperature of the lakes themselves, and that will that will ignite the lake effect machine, so to speak. So a lot of places downwind of the lakes that perhaps haven't seen a ton of snow recently will fill, see that activity fill in. Uh, you know, Mich portions of Michigan, northeast Ohio, parts of upstate New York, t the areas that typically see a lot of snow will, will see, thing, they'll see activity that is more more seasonable for them in terms of what they expect. But in this case, there could be a few uh, maybe one-week stretches where it gets to be a bit extreme. So that's what we're going to have to watch going forward. All right. Here's a question about climate change. What impact has climate change had on temperatures, and what impact do you anticipate going forward? Yeah, I can uh, answer that one. In terms of uh, specifically the winter season, uh, we've generally seen uh, the winter's uh, experiencing warmer temperatures over the last uh, decade or so, and primarily that's uh, uh, been with the uh, overnight minimum temperatures. Uh, the, the minimums have been warmer 
uh, than the uh, maximums have been uh, relative to normal. So that's one trend we've seen. But uh, more recently, maybe in the last uh, five to ten years, uh, temperatures have actually trended a little bit colder, according to uh, the data across uh, southern Canada and the uh, north central U.S. So uh, we're not going in a straight line, uh, warming warming up in that regard. We're we're starting to mix in some colder colder winters uh, in in the interior part of North America uh, more recently, um, as exemplified here by the next uh, next two months. So uh, I'll kind of back up that trend as well. Uh, but we're seeing more of, of consistent warming being in the real high latitudes, northern Canada, up in the Arctic regions, and more risk for colder conditions uh, starting to emerge more in the uh, middle latitudes, like uh, portions of Europe and uh, the, the uh, continental United States area. So there are uh, those type of regional differences, but again, the most consistent warming has been more up in the uh, in the Arctic areas. Uh, the rest of the seasons, uh, we are seeing generally a warmer trend, uh, uh, spring, fall, and uh, during the summer. Um, but uh, again, some regional areas where, where maybe the summers aren't quite as quite as warm, uh, and uh, some of that could be due to increased precipitation. But uh, um, um, there, there's maybe a leveling off of, of the warming that we've seen. Um, Occurring, uh, especially uh, especially in the winter, where, where most of the the warming effects uh, have have taken place over the last couple of decades. All right, and it looks like we have time for one more question, and we have a fun one to to close out before we wrap up. Um, what are the odds that we could see Major League Baseball games snowed out in the first week of the season? Nate, why don't you take that one? <laughs> well, everybody remembers last year where we did have quite a few of those games snowed out all the way in the middle part of April here. Um, and I, what I don't think we're going to have this year is a repeat of last year's spring season where we kept winter going all the way to the middle of April. But I think somewhere during that second half of March, probably leading right up to it, is where we'll have our transition that comes that goes from our cold, blocky pattern towards something a little bit more seasonable with with warm with the jet stream finally starting to lift northward here. So um I would probably estimate that we still have the odds are of a game or two probably getting snowed out. It was particular focus of course on the northern areas up towards the Great Lakes. But at this point here I think the odds are a lot less than last year and probably no more different than they they than they normally would be for any given season. Um I think that We'll see a quicker transition to spring than last year for sure. All right. Um, that's all the time we have for questions, so I'd like to just wrap up. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our midwinter seasonal outlook today. Our next outlook will be in March, and it will be uh, the spring outlook, which we're, we will address the severe weather season. And then we'll have one in May um, that is our hurricane outlook. As a reminder, I did record today's event, and I'll be sending out a U.S. region-specific infographic along with the link to the rebroadcast in 24 hours. If you'd like more information about long-range forecast services for your business, please email me and I'll put you in touch with our experts who are on the phone today. Also, if you have any additional questions or would like um, more information, um, our contact information, oh, it was listed on the screen, um, just go ahead and email me. Also, uh, go ahead and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, this concludes our event and thank you for joining us. Have a great day. <laughs>